What is going on, people? It's CJ, your Vegas Insider here. Today is Monday, and we are doing a top 10 college football video for you today. The last few videos I've made have been dealing with our college basketball season preview series. I want to go back and do a video about college football because, as you all know, college football season is in full view. We're actually more than two-thirds of the way through the season and we had another big week of college football. Well, most of the most of the top teams were actually off on bye weeks, but we had a little shakeup in the top 10. And the playoff picture is becoming a little more clear. It's definitely becoming more clear week in and week out. So I wanted to touch on my top 10 college football with current futures. And the current futures part is what's important. This weekend, I live close to the South Point. This weekend, the South Point had a big event going on, and it brought in a lot of tourists. So the poker games were amazing on Saturday and Sunday at the South Point. I was playing the two, three, uh, no limit Hold'em games, buying in for like 500, 600. And I played 13 hours on Saturday and 11 hours again yesterday on Sunday. And that just wore me out. So I wasn't able to make any videos the last couple days, but go ahead and check out my college basketball uh, preview series. I did make a video a couple days ago where I ranked number 19 through 17, and a couple days before that, I did number 22 through 20 in the college basketball series. But now let's go ahead and shift gears and go back to college football, and let's get into our college football top 10 for week 10. Coming in at number 10, the University of Minnesota. New to the Vegas Insider top 10, the Golden Gophers land here uh, by way of an 8-0 record and much improved play as the season has gone on. Minnesota was uh, not a very good looking team the first several weeks of the season. They had built an undefeated record at like 3-0 and 4-0, but they were not good in the non-conference. They barely beat South Dakota State at home. They, it took a miracle win against Fresno to continue on undefeated, and they barely beat one of the one of the directional Georgia teams. I can't, Georgia Southern or, or Georgia State, or some Georgia directional team they barely beat. And it looked like Minnesota was just going to end up being a team that would be like 6-6 six and six or, you know, whatever. Nothing, nothing to be excited about or to keep your eyes on. But uh, give credit to Minnesota. They've gotten better in conference play and as the season's gone on. They're obviously figuring things out. If we look at the last four games for Minnesota, their last four games were 40-17 to 17 over Illinois, 34 to 7 against Nebraska, 42 to 7 against Rutgers, and 52 to 10 against Maryland. So they're getting the job done. I think the more current games carry more weight than the early games where they really struggled. Now, I will be the first to say there's a very good chance that Minnesota taking up residence in my top 10 could be very short lived. They host Penn State this week, and then after that, they play at Iowa. Then they play at Northwestern, which uh, Northwestern's terrible, but it's still a conference road game. And then they host Wisconsin. So their, their, uh, their schedule strength is definitely backloaded to the end of the schedule here. They, they are a six and a half point dog against Penn State this week. I assume that regardless of what happens this week, they'll probably be an underdog at Iowa. And the game hosting Wisconsin the last game of the season... If they're favored, I don't think it would be more than a point or so. They'll probably be still be like a two to three point dog. I'm just guessing. I'm projecting in that Wisconsin game. So it's very likely they could lose two of these last four games and finish with a 10 and two record. I think if you win three out of the four and go 11 and one, you should be very happy as a Minnesota fan. Because first of all, if you win three out of four and go 11 and one, it puts you in the big tw in the Big Ten championship game. And then if you win that game against either Ohio State or Penn State, now you're talking legitimate playoff chance. So even if you lose a game here, I, I, I think Minnesota's still sitting in a very good spot. We're going to see what they're made of this week because Penn State's got an incredible defense. We'll be talking about them more in this countdown. But with the way they've been playing the last month, the fact that they've been improving week in and week out, I think Minnesota definitely deserves a shot in the top 10, and we'll see based on the game this week against Penn State if, if they're going to stick around or not. Number nine, Utah. 
It looks like the Pac-12, I'll be the first to admit, I left the Pac-12 for dead as far as the college football playoff was concerned. But it looks like Utah or Oregon, if those two teams can win out, and then the, whoever wins in that Pac-12 championship game, it looks like they're going to have a decent shot at making the college football playoff. Of course, there's a lot of things that still have to work themselves out. But you have everything to play for if you're, if you're Utah or if you're Oregon here. And looking at Utah's schedule, okay, well, they, the last game they played, they beat Washington at Washington 33-28. to They have about the easiest schedule of any team in the top 10. I would say uh, Clemson and Utah have the easiest paths to, into their championship game. Utah plays UCLA at Arizona and Colorado. The UCLA and the Colorado game being at home. If they're going to lose a game, it's going to be on the road at Arizona. But let's be honest, U Utah's a very well-coached team, so they're not going to be looking ahead to the Colorado game in that spot. When they go to Tucson, they're going to understand that that's their toughest remaining game of the season. So I would think they win that game. Uh, Arizona's just been a disaster. Kevin Sumlin's been, a, in my opinion, a complete disaster at Arizona. None of these teams Utah plays are any good. And if you're a team with any even possible hopes of playing in a New Year's Six Bowl or the college football playoff or playing for a conference championship, these should be very easy blowout victories. I can't see Utah losing a game. I think they finish 11-1 and and go into the Pac-12 championship with a shot at the college football playoff. So exciting if you're a Utah Utes fan. Everything looks good, and the path ahead looks clear. And for now, we have Utah at number nine and possibly moving higher. Number eight, Oregon. Oregon dismantled USC 56-24. to Although the game was not that close in terms of statistics, USC was actually outgaining Oregon at the half of that game. But Oregon just made all the big plays. USC just imploded and made all the stupid plays, pick sixes, big penalties, turnovers, and look, give Oregon credit. They went, into, they went on the road into a hostile environment. They were only a five-point favorite and picked up a 32-point win. So that's definitely impressive. A couple things about Oregon. The offense looks great. The defense was great in the beginning of the season. The defense has looked a little softer the last few weeks. They're still only averaging 15.8 points per game, giving up on the defensive end, and that's very good. But I think the last several weeks, it's been like 35, 31, and then 24 last week. I'm, I'm not too concerned about Oregon. I think they have a pretty uh, easy path to meeting Utah in the conference championship. When we look at Oregon's schedule, uh, they have Arizona at home, at Arizona State and Oregon State at home. Now, for sure, Arizona at home and Oregon State at home, those are both wins, guaranteed. There's just no way they're going to drop either of those games at home in Eugene. The only possible stumbling block here is at ASU, but I think it's another thing like with uh, Utah's game at Arizona. It's not a game where they're going to be caught looking ahead. There's no way they're going to be looking ahead to Oregon State when they play at ASU. So I think they'll give their best effort in that game and that should be good enough for a win. It's just one of those things where playing Arizona State in Tempe has been tough for a lot of teams um, in the Herm Edwards era so far. The, these two years that Edwards has been at ASU, they pulled off some nice victories at home. And this is gonna be one of those things where this will be Arizona State season. Uh, hosting Oregon in this game. It'll be nationally televised uh, on Fox, I believe. And so Arizona State will be up for this game, but I think Oregon will be up for it too. So what I see coming down the... I mean, this is one where Oregon could get upset, but I, I don't really see it happening. I think Oregon's going to finish 11-1. and one. I think Utah's going to finish 11-1. and one. And since this channel is all about making money and being a predictive channel, being that we're in Vegas and all, I would bet that you're going to have a 12-1 Pac-12 champion. It's either going to be Oregon or Utah. I'm not sure who. 
Uh, I think those teams are pretty evenly matched. I would probably lean toward Oregon at this point. But when I put up the futures at the end of this top 10, it's definitely something we can look at uh, as far as finding value that we could see a Pac-12 champ in the playoff after all. Number seven, Oklahoma. Oklahoma had a bye last week, and boy, they needed it after taking a huge upset loss to Kansas State, one that can really hurt their playoff chances. At this point, I think the winner of Utah, Oregon, may have a stronger case for making the playoff than Oklahoma, especially Oregon. Let's say Oregon finishes 12-1 and and Oklahoma finishes 12-1. and Well, Oregon's going to have a quality win against Utah, but their loss is much better than Oklahoma's. Now, of course, I'm just projecting into the future, but let's just say it comes down to Oregon 12-1, and Oklahoma 12-1 and for the last playoff spot. I think Oklahoma's in real trouble here because if your loss is to Kansas State and Oregon's only loss is a very close loss, you know, last-minute loss to a good Auburn team, I would probably give the edge to Oregon. Uh, we'll see. I mean, Oklahoma does have the star power. They do have Jalen Hurts in that fun offense. But I'm getting way ahead of myself here because let's just talk about Oklahoma for a second. Oklahoma's got a much tougher path to finishing the season with one loss than an Oregon or a Utah. Oregon had a or Oklahoma had a bye last week. What they have coming up this week, Iowa State, then at Baylor, who's ranked 11th, TCU at home, and then at Oklahoma State. Now, there are some real landmines there. I think Oklahoma State playing OU at home in the Bedlam game, that's going to be a tough game for Oklahoma. And uh, Oak State, the way Chuba Hubbard's playing, the way they run the ball, that could be, I would put Oklahoma on upset alert in that game. Oklahoma State usually plays Oklahoma pretty tough, even though they don't beat them very often. But being that they're hosting this game in Stillwater, that could be a tough game. The at Baylor game can obviously be a tough game. And then this one, this is, the, this is a game where Oklahoma better take the opponent seriously even though they're at home. Iowa State has played Oklahoma tough the last several years. And just side note, why am I wearing the Iowa State fleece? Well, it's because, like I've told you, if you've been watching the college basketball videos, when I have a huge future on a college basketball team, I tend to get excited and go out and buy the hoodie. Last year, my brother and I had 200 to 1 futures on Iowa State, and they were looking like they might win the Big 12 last year in basketball. We're talking about basketball now. So my brother got excited. He bought us a couple of, couple of jackets. Uh, long story short, Iowa State kind of limped down the stretch and, and – uh, you know, looked terrible in their first tournament game against Iowa State, and that was a wrap on their season. But at least I got a, a decent jacket out of it. So I am wearing it because I'm hoping that they can knock off Oklahoma. Oklahoma is one of the teams I don't have futures on this year in college football. So I would like to see Oklahoma take another loss just to eliminate them from the college football playoff. Now, that's just me being selfish, talking about my own monetary interest. But as far as breaking down the teams for you and and trying to have a channel that is uh, somewhat diligent and that you can get something out of. I'm always going to talk about a team not based on what I want to happen, but based on what I see and what I think is going to happen. So, you know, with Oklahoma, you have to be impressed with the offense still. Uh, at 49.3 uh, at points per game, it ranks first in the country. They, their passing numbers are 346 per game, 346 passing yards per game, which is fourth in the nation, 252 rushing yards per game, which is 11th in the nation. So it's an elite balanced offense, both running and passing. Oklahoma should win. They should win out from this point forward, right? Like I said before, their schedule is their remaining schedule is one of the toughest of any of the teams on here. Just being in that Iowa State and Baylor and Oklahoma State represent three potential tough games. I mean, even TCU could give them a decent game, although I don't expect it. But TCU is one of those teams that they can jump up and bite you too if you sleep on them. So I think of having four weeks where they don't have any quote-unquote easy opponents, 
makes their schedule a little tougher. But that being said, they should still win out and get to 11-1 and and get to the Big 12 championship game. The problem is the Big 12 championship game is not going to be a marquee win. If you play Texas, if you play possibly Baylor again, but that would mean Baylor takes at least one loss because they play Oklahoma. And let, let I'll just be honest here. I don't think Baylor's really that good. They barely beat West Virginia at home. They should have lost to Texas Tech. They got a gift from the referees in the Texas Tech game. It's one of the reasons I have Minnesota ranked and Baylor not. I'm just still, I'm more sold on Minnesota and more impressed with the way Minnesota's been playing the last several weeks than Baylor. So when you look at the Oregon-Utah game, when they play each other, that's going to be a much better win in the Pac-12 for whoever wins that game than what Oklahoma gets in the Big 12 championship. And Texas has just fallen off the rails right now at this point. So it, it's just too bad for Oklahoma that you don't have a, a an elite game left. The, the game at Baylor is your best game the rest of the year, but beating Baylor is not as good as Oregon beating Utah or Utah beating Oregon, in my opinion. And the other problem is the loss to Kansas State is just a far worse loss than Oregon losing to Auburn or even... Even uh, Utah losing at USC. I think that's still probably a better loss than Oklahoma losing to Kansas State. So regardless, I think Oklahoma's in real trouble here as far as making the playoff. But all you can do is go out now and beat the four teams that are left on your schedule, win the Big 12 championship, and hope for some hope and see what happens. Number six, Georgia. If you watch my college football top ten uh, video from a couple weeks ago, after Georgia lost to South Carolina... Yes, I got on here and said Georgia took an absolutely terrible loss to an inferior Gamecocks team. Yet, I still had them ranked in that top 10. I think I either had them at number 10 or number 9, even right after that loss. And I still said, don't panic, Georgia fans. You have everything to play for. If you win out, you're going to the playoff. You still have elite talent all over the field. The one thing I talked about in that video was that Georgia had a deficiency with play calling. They had a really serious lack of big play ability, and the play calling just looked very stale and unimaginative, especially in the passing game. So here's my revision from that video a couple weeks ago. It's obvious to me, and kudos to Kirby Smart and the coaching staff at Georgia, that they used their bye week and got the absolute most out of the bye week. Because when they played Florida last week and beat Florida by seven, Jake Fromm looked like a completely new quarterback. He looked like the Jake Fromm of old, carving defenses up, being very efficient, getting some big plays down the field. It looked like a whole new offense. This looked like the Georgia team that has as good a chance as Alabama or LSU or Clemson uh, or Ohio State of winning the college football playoff. One little sidetrack I want to talk about the game because I watched the entire Georgia-Florida game last week. Also, if you watched the previous videos, you know that I had a 1,000-1 to 1 future on Florida to win the college football playoff. So obviously, I was rooting for Florida in, in that game against Georgia last week. Now, granted, Georgia was a six-point favorite, and I know sports books aren't run by idiots, so I was well aware that Georgia was probably going to win the game. But of course, I was still rooting for Florida. I had almost a hundred grand worth of Florida futures sitting out there. So of course, I had a big rooting interest in Florida. Now, this is going to sound like sour grapes because it is. Because it is. Because I lost with Florida. But I, who was the replay official refereeing this game? Uh, you know, it's bad enough that you're a six-point dog in this game... But the, the replay booth official basically gave Georgia at least four points early on in this game. If you watch the game, if you're a Georgia fan or a Florida fan, I know you know what I'm talking about. It was either in the first quarter or early in the second quarter. Georgia was up 3-0. They were in the red zone. They had a third and five or third and six, uh, I, I think around the Florida 15-yard line. Fromm throws a pass. The receiver... Uh, he, you know, it was ruled as a catch for a first down inside the Florida 10, 
But it was obvious on the replay that he didn't catch the ball. The ball clearly hits the ground before he has control of it. And even Gary Danielson was saying, like, oh, for sure this is going to get overturned. This is an easy call. Georgia's going to have to settle for a field goal, right? So, of course, what happens? The idiot replay booth official upholds the first down, says he catches the ball, which is crazy to me. Georgia goes in and scores a touchdown, and now they have a 10-0 lead. In a game like this, with two good defenses, where points are going to be at a premium, a four-point play is a huge play. And that's not even to say they would have made the field goal, right? I mean, I assume Blankenship would have made the field goal, but anything could have happened. You could have had a bad snap. You could have had it blocked. I mean, a million things can go wrong, right? So this idiot replay official cost Florida for sure four points, possibly seven points. And it was just one of those things where Georgia had complete control of the game at that point, being up 10-0 as opposed to 6-0 or 3-0. And give Georgia credit. I mean, they used that to keep control throughout the game and win the game. Now, I'm not saying Florida would have won the game had, had the call been the correct call. I'm just saying they would have had a lot better chance at 6-0 than 10-0. So uh, whoever this knucklehead replay official was who gets the benefit of looking at replay and still gets an easy call wrong, to me, that's just unforgivable. Like, it's one thing for the officials to blow a call in real time when, when things are happening fast and moving fast. It's quite another thing for the replay official who gets to look at slow motion replay over and over and over again as many times as he wants to make sure he gets the call right. So whoever you are, replay official, I expect you're driving a new Maserati or a new Bentley this week after that, after that horrible call, because it's obvious you had an interest on Georgia winning this game. Oh, and, and by the way, another thing. The line was six. Georgia six. Well, what happened? They won by seven and covered by one point because of this horrible call, one of the worst calls you'll ever see in college football. Now, I didn't bet Florida in this game. This Florida losing cost me very little money. I had about a hundred dollar future on Florida. It's just, it was a fun future because I had such good odds. So of course I wanted them to win. It didn't hurt my pocketbook. It's just amazing to me how you can have such an easy call and get it wrong. And it just makes you wonder. It just makes you wonder like, did this guy, has his car been upgraded from a Honda Civic to a Bentley? It's possible. It's possible. So whoever you are, you know who you are and you know what you did. But that was, that was just an atrocious call. And I rambled on way too long about that. But that's what I do. I live in Vegas and that's what I do. Let me talk a little more about Georgia. Georgia is the team that can destroy the college playoff for all the other one-loss teams. So if you're an Oregon fan, if you're a Utah fan, an Oklahoma fan, um, maybe a, you know, an LSU or Alabama fan, whoever loses that game, the Penn State, Ohio State loser, whoever has one loss there, you better hope Georgia loses another game. Because if Georgia wins out, they are definitely going to the college football playoff and they are definitely taking a spot from one of these other one-loss teams. If Georgia wins out, you could... You could kiss the Pac-12 goodbye for the college football playoff. There's no way a one-loss Oregon or Utah is getting in over a one-loss Georgia. There's no way the loser of the Alabama-LSU game gets in over Georgia. There's no way the loser of the Ohio State-Penn State game gets in over Georgia. So if you're a fan of any of those teams, you better hope Georgia loses at Auburn. That game is coming up. It's not their next game. Their next game is Missouri. Missouri could be a dangerous game if they were playing on the road at Missouri. Good news for Georgia fans, you got them at home. Missouri can't beat anybody on the road. They're absolutely, they are Jekyll and Hyde as far as playing at home and playing on the road. You'll have no problems blowing them out at home. Then you play at Auburn. Then you get A&M at home, which should be an easy game. Uh, playing a and M's not that good, and especially playing them at home. Similar to Missouri, that should be an easy win. And then, of course, at Georgia Tech, but you'll win that game by 30. So your only chance to lose before the SEC title game is at Auburn. 
And they could lose that game. I mean, playing on the road at Jordan-Hare, that's not easy for anybody. That's kind of a 50-50 toss-up game, in my opinion, because it's at Auburn. I would still think the better team will win that game. I would probably play Georgia in that game. If the line is three or less, I may actually put a wager on Georgia. That's two weeks away. We'll, we'll see when we get there. But the point is, it's not an easy win. And it is, it is a game they could conceivably lose. So if you're an Oklahoma fan, a Pac-12 fan, whatever, a, a fan of a one-loss team you want to see in the playoff, you better hope Georgia loses that game. And I'll talk more about the playoff when I'm done with this ranking. We'll, we'll get back to the futures and talk about the playoff. I'll expound on that a little more. But Georgia's the one team that can really muck it up for a lot of teams in the college football playoff. Number five. Penn State. Well, there's not too much to talk about Penn State. They had a bye last week, as most of the teams in the top five did. But I will just go over their upcoming schedule. Penn State, they play at Minnesota, uh, 9 a.m. Well, 9 a.m. my time. I live on West Coast time in the wonderful city of Las Vegas. 9 a.m. on ABC, so I'll definitely be watching that game. because that, that game will be a lot of fun. And then they host Indiana, play at Ohio State, and then host Rutgers. So, for sure they beat Indiana and Rutgers at home. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Their season comes down to two games. At Minnesota and at Ohio State. Now, the funny thing here is, the Minnesota game really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter whether they win or lose this game at Minnesota. And you might think, well, CJ, that's crazy. You're talking nonsense. You, you, winning every game is important. But here's the thing. If they beat Minnesota but lose at Ohio State, then they don't play in the, big, in the Big Ten championship game and their college football playoff hopes could be shot, especially if a team like Georgia wins out like I was talking about a second ago. But if they lose to Minnesota, and let's just say it's at least close, as long as they don't lose 38-7 to Minnesota, but then they beat Ohio State... Now, they get to play in the Big Ten Championship game because they would have the tiebreaker over Ohio State. They would get a rematch against Minnesota, the team they lost to. Now you can avenge that loss in the Big Ten Championship game. And if you win, you are in the playoff. I think for sure the Big Ten champ is in the playoff. I think for sure Clemson is going to be in the playoff. We'll talk about that in a second. For sure the SEC champ is in the playoff. So those are three spots taken up right there, three of the four playoff spots. So Penn State can lose to Minnesota, but beat Ohio State and make the playoff. If they beat Minnesota but lose to Ohio State, now there's a very good chance you don't make the playoff because you don't even get to play in the Big, in the Big Ten title game. So anyway, that's just something I thought I'd throw out there if you're a Penn State fan. Obviously, you want to beat Minnesota. You want to look good. But even if you lose to Minnesota, it's going to be like Georgia losing to South Carolina a few weeks ago. You will still have everything to play for. And if you win out, you will be in the playoff, I guarantee you, even if you drop this game to Minnesota. And another thing is, even if you lose to Minnesota, that would make Minnesota 9-0. Then you know Minnesota's, they're going to beat Northwestern. That, that makes Minnesota 10-0. The worst case scenario is Minnesota would finish 10 and 2, so that's going to be a good loss. Let's just say Minnesota finishes 11 and 1 and wins the Big 10 West. Well, now that one loss looks totally fine. You would lose to an 11 and 1 team, a team you would be playing again in the Big 10 Championship. You avenge that loss by beating them and you're in the playoff. So this game does not mean as much as the Ohio State game. Penn State's whole world, whole season is going to come down to that Ohio State game. Unfortunately for you guys, it's on the road in Columbus, and uh, good luck winning that one. I, I, I love Penn State. I love what James Franklin's done. I love the defense. Quick stat, they're allowing less than 10 points per game, their defense. They're allowing 9.6 points per game. The most a team has scored on them all year is Michigan, scoring 21. And the second most points they've allowed after that was Buffalo at 13. So Penn State's for real on the defensive side. The offense is getting better. A lot of new pieces on that offense, but they're finding they're finding playmakers with uh, KJ Hamlin. You know, Sean Clifford's playing better week in and week out. The the freshman running back is 
playing better each week. So Noah Kane. So they're uh, the offense is getting better at the right time. I I I love this Penn State team. I just don't look. Being honest, I just don't see you beating Ohio State on the road. But upsets happen, and hopefully for you guys, you can get one there. And we'll learn a lot more about him playing on the road at Minnesota. We'll definitely learn a lot about Minnesota in this game. This game, this game will tell us if Minnesota's for real, and the Penn State-Ohio State game will obviously tell us if Penn State's for real. Number four, LSU. Yes, I'm keeping LSU at number four. I can't move LSU or Alabama into the top spot until they play. Uh, again, it's a predictive channel. It's, I'm all about predicting value, finding value on the future line. Since Bama and LSU play each other, it's very hard for me to say either team holds value on the future line right now. And as of this week, as of right now, Vegas has Alabama seven-point favorite. Some books have seven, some have six and a half. The point is, it's it's like the Auburn or like the Georgia Florida game last week, where Vegas had Georgia as a six-point favorite. Chances are Alabama's going to win this game, and I've been saying that all season. I've been saying that yes, you could say LSU's the number one team based on their body of work. They have some great wins. However. They're probably not going to beat Alabama. It's a I'll believe it when I see it type deal. And even with Tua as a question mark, Vegas still has Alabama a seven-point favorite. Seven points is a lot in football. Seven-point favorites usually win. And that also tells me another thing. It tells me Tua's playing in that game. And it tells me Tua's relatively healthy. And if you give me a relatively healthy two in this game, I'm taking Alabama. I'm sorry. I, I actually love LSU as far as being a fan. If I had to pick a favorite team in college football, I lived in Louisiana for a while. LSU would be my team. I'd love to see him win that game. But again, I, I vote with my pocketbook and my dollar. And I just don't see Saban losing this game at home. This is a game for Alabama where if, if Alabama wins this game, book them for the college football playoff. They're, them and Clemson cement two spots in the college football playoff. Well, that's talking about Bama. We'll, we'll, we'll get to them uh, next, as a matter of fact. Talking about LSU here. So the schedule plays out after this game at Alabama. Then it's at Ole Miss, Arkansas at home, A&M at home. Those should be three wins. Uh, Ole Miss is kind of a rivalry game. I've actually gone to Ole Miss LSU games in person, being that I went to school in Louisiana. And Ole Miss is a rival. I mean, every game in the SEC is a rivalry game, but Ole Miss always gives LSU their best shot. And being that they're playing them at home in Oxford, I'm telling you right now, this is one of those games where the public is just going to, Bet LSU, bet LSU, because, you know, Ole Miss is bad this year or whatever. So if this line ends up being like LSU minus 25 or or even maybe even like minus 22, 22 and a half, I might get on Ole Miss in this game because Ole Miss always gives LSU their best shot. They always give LSU a tough game and playing them at home, especially if LSU loses. LSU comes off a loss. Well, either way. They might be too high coming off a win if they actually win this game. Or if they lose, it's going to be another devastating loss where it's like, we're never going to beat Saban. We lost again. We're out of the SEC title chase again. Even though they wouldn't be out of the playoff with a close loss. But point being, it's going to be a devastating loss. I could see them going into Oxford and not covering that number because they're going to be a big favorite. So that's what we're all about on this channel is making money. I'll talk about that when we get there. That might be a game I play uh, Ole Miss with the points. But but LSU should win the game regardless. And then they beat Arkansas, beat AM. and I like, obviously, you gotta you got to love LSU's offense. The running game's coming along and getting better. The passing yards per game, 378, which is second in the nation. A complete 180 from how they've been the last five to eight years or so where the passing offense has just been absolutely terrible, even though they line up NFL, future NFL receivers all over the field. 
So I love what LSU's done. I can't wait for this game. Just like every other college football fan out there, it's the best game of the season. So we'll see what happens. Uh, scoring offense, 46.8. That ranks fourth. But LSU fans, be ready to deal with reality, which is most likely Vegas is telling you Y'all are going to lose this game again for about, what, the ninth or tenth straight time to Saban? And, man, I just, I just can't find, I can't find much value with betting you on the future line if I see you taking a loss right here, and it's a loss that would keep you out of the SEC title game. Number three, Alabama. Okay, so I was kind of alluding to this when I was talking about LSU and their game coming up. If Alabama wins this game against LSU, they are absolutely in the college football playoff. And let me explain why. Well, I uh, sorry, let me backtrack. I can't say absolutely. They could lose at Auburn and to Georgia, and that would keep them out. So that was wrong of me to say they're absolutely in the, in, in the uh, football playoff, but it's very likely. As long as they either beat Auburn or Georgia, then they're in the college football playoff. Another way of saying it is, if they take one loss, they're absolutely in the college football playoff. Because if Alabama wins this game, they win the SEC West, even with a loss to Auburn, because they would have the tiebreaker over LSU, and then they would play Georgia. So, if they lose to Auburn, all you have to do is beat Georgia and you're in. If you beat Auburn and finish the season 12-0 and lose to Georgia in the SEC championship game, I'm telling you right now, you're still in the playoff. There's no way the committee is keeping a 12-1 Alabama team out of the playoff. They're just not. The only way Alabama would miss the playoff at 12-1 is if that one loss was to, like, Ole Miss or, or some just garbage team, South Carolina, something stupid like that. And, and they didn't win the SEC championship game. But, but just the way it's playing out, the way the schedule sets up, if they win against LSU and take one more loss even, but just finish it, as long as they don't lose two more games, you're in the playoff. Let's talk about some of Alabama's numbers. Uh, points for, 48.6, that's second in the nation. Points against, 15.3. That's a lot better than people are giving uh, Alabama's defense credit for. When you watch like the mainstream college football you know, channels on ESPN or Fox or wherever, the mainstream media, when they're talking about Alabama's defense, all they talk about is how bad Alabama's defense is this year. Oh, they're nowhere near you know, Saban's defenses of the past. They can't stop anybody. They give up so many points and yards. Well, that's partially true, and I'm going to go ahead and take the other side uh, with, my, with my money on this one, so to speak. The defenses haven't been as good as what Saban's put on the field in years past. Okay, fine, I agree with that. However, they're only allowing 15 points a game. And a lot of times they're so far ahead of teams. When you're up 31 to nothing or, or 45 to 10 in a game, it doesn't matter if you give up an 80-yard drive. Like, you literally can take series off. You can take drives off. What was it, the South Carolina game where they gave up like 400 yards passing to Ryan Holinsky and they gave up 23 points? But they won the game 49 to 23. The game was never in doubt. Do you think... Honestly, if Alabama was playing a close game against South Carolina, they would let Ryan Holinsky light him up for 400 yards. I'm telling you right now, they wouldn't. A lot of that, a lot of those yards, a lot of those points Alabama's defense gives up, they're garbage points and garbage yards. You just have to understand that as somebody who, you know, for lack of a better word, I don't want to brag about myself, but is kind of an expert at this or really follows this or really pays attention to what's going on. I guarantee you against a good team in a close game, Alabama's going to tighten that defense up. They just are. So while everybody's talking about how bad their defense is, I'm telling you right now their defense is not bad. And you're going to see a different defense against LSU. We'll see what LSU's made of this year. If anything, I might bet the under in this game because I think both LSU's defense and Alabama's defense are loaded with tons of good athletes. 
The offense scores so many points that the defense can take series off, plays off, whatever, even whole quarters off when you're up by 30. I have a feeling this is going to be much more of a hard-hitting, smash-mouth, might even be a little, little of a grinded-out type game. I might play the under here because I think both defenses are going to show up. And talking about the rest of Alabama's, uh, the rest of the tied schedule after LSU, it's at Mississippi State. Uh, uh, geez, home at Western Carolina. Alabama always has this game right before the Auburn game. It's always against some Southern directional FCS team at home, right? Th this year it's Western Carolina. I think last year was the Citadel or whatever. It's always some local team that needs a, you know, needs a payday. So Alabama probably pays them a million dollars or half a million dollars to come get their asses whooped by them. Every, every year before the Auburn game. And then the final game's at Auburn. Uh, at Mississippi State, that was a tough game a couple years ago on the road at Mississippi State. Uh, it won't be this year. They're going to absolutely blow them out. And then, of course, Western Carolina, they probably win by, uh, by 40 or 50. And then uh, I was talking about at Auburn. At Auburn looks like a tough game. I don't see it being a tough game for Alabama this year. I think the tide rolls in this game. When you put Bo Nix up against this defense, and I know everybody's saying the Alabama defense has taken a step back. I, I think Bo Nix will not light this defense up. I think the defense will be fine. And it's just hard to get stops over and over again against this Alabama offense. How many times can you stop Tua? How many times can you stop Najee Harris and that mammoth offensive line that's all future NFL picks? How, how many drives can you stop the greatest receiving core of all time in college football. Alabama's only given up 15 points a game on defense. There's no way you're going to hold Alabama under 20 points in a game. Nobody will. It's impossible. Alabama's going to score 20 or more points every game. You, you can put that in pen, write that in cement, whatever. Whatever analogy you want to use, I don't know. My point is you have to be able to keep – if you have any chance of beating Alabama, your offense has to be able to keep up. Fortunately for LSU, they have an offense that can theoretically keep up, which gives them a chance to win. I don't think Auburn's offense can catch up. Auburn has a great defense. I love their defense. But there's no way they're, they're going to shut – Alabama down for an entire game and there's no way they're going to get them off the field enough to where they can run out this crappy pedestrian offense and expect to beat Alabama. So I'm kind of giving you some future plays right now. Uh, I've seen Alabama Auburn on the future line as Alabama minus 10 and a half. I like it. I think Alabama is going to roll in that game. And what was the other one I was talking about? Uh, there was another one. Oh, Ole Miss against LSU. I think when that line comes out, if it's 21 or more, if you're getting three touchdowns or more on Ole Miss at home, I'd probably play Ole Miss on that game. I think Ole Miss could give LSU a good game. But we already talked about that. We're counting them down. Let's get to number two on our countdown. The Clemson Tigers. Clemson beat Wofford 59-14 uh, to 14 last week. Not really much to talk about there. I mean, it is Wofford. Now, Wofford is one of the better FCS teams, but it's still a you know lower classification FCS school. Uh, you can't really get too excited about that. What I am excited about, though, is something I've been saying in the, in the last several college football videos I've made. Another thing where I call ESPN and Fox the mainstream college football news, the fake news, Everybody was ready to leave Clemson for dead after that close game against North Carolina. And what I've been saying for weeks now is that was the best thing that could have ever happened to Clemson was getting the bejesus scared out of them, almost having their season completely derailed, but somehow finding a way to win that game. And now it's really benefiting them because they're not taking anybody lightly. They're focused. Trevor Lawrence is playing better. They're finally getting Travis Etienne going, which I thought they should have been doing all season, but they are getting him going. The defense has been, the defense is just like Georgia's defense. Georgia's defense, Clemson's defense, they've been solid all season. The kind of bumps in the road for those two teams have kind of been in the passing game. But it seems like they both figured that out, and especially Clemson. Now, I understand the ACC sucks, 
and Clemson's not playing against the best competition, I get that. But you can only play who you're scheduled against. They signed up to be in the ACC. They have to play ACC teams. But it's how impressive they've been looking. And their athletes are just so much more superior, especially at the skill positions, than every team they run into. It, it's so difficult to stop the future number one pick in two years in the draft in Trevor Lawrence, uh, Justin Ross and T. Higgins, two future NFL wide receivers. What are they both like? Six four, six five, can jump out of the can jump, you know, out of the gym and to use a basketball reference. Those are future, probably future first round guys. You have Travis Etienne, arguably he's definitely top five running backs in college football. He's gonna be a first round pick. It's, uh, it's just an embarrassment of riches, uh, talent-wise, for this Clemson team. And if you look just on paper at recruiting rankings for the past several years, Clemson, Alabama, Georgia are at the top of the list. So it's no wonder that those three teams are right in the mix for making the college football playoff. Right below those three, just in terms of recruiting talent, you have, I'd say, Ohio State, and then maybe like LSU just coming below that. And then Penn State's probably another notch below those teams. Clemson is not losing a game this season. They are taking up one of the four spots in the college football playoff. I've been saying that for weeks. Now I'm starting to hear other people say that. It's about time you caught on. Uh, I have a YouTube channel with hardly any subscribers yet because it's brand new and not that many people watching. But if you are watching, you'll get the right information before ESPN gives it to you, before Fox Sports gives it to you. Uh, I've said it at nauseum, but I do this for a living in the city of Las Vegas. So if I'm stupid, I'm homeless. The fact that I have a camcorder and I, you know, live with a roof over my head and obviously I get plenty to eat, that tells you that I kind of know what I'm doing because if I was a moron, I'd be living in a homeless camp right now. So Travis Etienne, his stats right now, going into week 11, he has 123 rushes for 100, or excuse me, 123 rushes for 1,102 yards. That is an average of nine yards a carry. Nine yards a carry. A lot, a lot of people talk about the, the best running back in the country being Jonathan Taylor, and I don't have a problem with that. I think Jonathan Taylor is amazing. His yards per carry, and I don't have it in front of me, I didn't look it up, because Wisconsin's dead to me. That's another story for another time. I had a lot of futures on them. But I think his yards per rush is somewhere around maybe five and a half. Travis Etienne is averaging nine yards per carry. And now, granted, I know the schedule's easier because the ACC sucks compared to the Big Ten. But still, I mean, that's still impressive no matter who you're playing. And it just shows their big play explosive ability. It is back if you're Clemson. They can hit you with the home run in the running game with ETN, they can hit home runs left and right on you in the passing game. And we've seen Trevor Lawrence, even when he makes bad decisions and just throws it up for grabs, yes, he's thrown some picks doing that, but he's also thrown a lot of 50-50 jump balls that T. Higgins and Justin Ross have come down with in the end zone for touchdowns. So even when they play bad, they're still dangerous. Uh, I really, of all these teams on the future line, which I'm about to put up, uh, Clemson holds the most value by far for me just because I know they're going to be in the playoff. And when they get there, they are the defending champ. So uh, good luck if, if you have to play Clemson in the playoff. That's all I have to say. Uh, they're here and they ain't going anywhere. And one more point on Clemson. Uh, I almost left this stat out. I have to throw this out here. They have the perfect amount of balance on offense. Rushing yards per game, 272.4. Passing yards per game, 273. It doesn't get any better than that, does it? The exact same amount of yards, uh, less than one yard difference between their running and passing. I don't know what you defend. Uh, you, you know, the I watch games all day long on Saturday because this is what I do. And I remember watching the Texas A&M Clemson game. That was one of those games where Clemson's offense didn't look that good when people were starting to be down on them. And granted, their offense wasn't great on that game. It was a game where ETN really struggled. Give Texas A&M credit. Texas A&M had a plan. 
They said, we're taking ETN away. Every time ETN was in the backfield, Texas A&M took a spy linebacker and had him just following ETN. They were going to let Trevor Lawrence beat him. Now, what happened? Well, I mean, Trevor Lawrence didn't have an amazing game, but he had a decent game. The defense played well, and Clemson did beat them. But kudos to Texas A&M on having a plan. If you're going to play Clemson, I think you have to pick your poison. You have to eliminate something and make something beat you. If you just go out there and try to run your defense man up, like if you don't, if you don't take away either you know, T. Higgins or Justin Ross or take away ETN, if you just try to play their offense with your defense athlete on athlete, you're probably going to get killed in both the run game and the pass game, which is what Clemson's showing you. I think you're better off being like what Jimbo Fisher and AM did, taking away somebody and making somebody beat you and just hoping they have a bad game. Another thing about that game... When, when ETN left the field and the backup running back came in for Clemson, a and didn't play the spy linebacker on that running back. Then they played him straight up. They played it more to where they were defending the pass. And if you notice, the backup running back for Clemson had a good game against a and where ETN just got completely shut down in that game. And that, like I said, was a direct... A result of AM taking ETN away and making the other guys beat him. I think you have to do that if you play Clemson, but the way Trevor Lawrence is starting to play, he's making fewer mistakes, he's gaining confidence, he's the future number one overall pick in the draft, he has a national title under his belt. Good luck. Good luck with challenging him to beat you. I have a feeling he might just beat you. And last but not least, our number one team in the nation, the Ohio State Buckeyes. I just can't put anybody else here ahead of Ohio State. They have the number one point per game differential in the country. They're scoring 48.3, giving up 7.9. That is absolutely unbelievable. And it's not like all the teams they've played are complete garbage. They have played Wisconsin. They have played Michigan State. They have played Cincinnati. Cincinnati's turned into a pretty good group of five team. Yes, they haven't played the toughest schedule in the land, but they do look on both sides of the ball, top to bottom, the best team to me. Like Clemson getting ETN going, Ohio State is really starting to get J.K. Dobbins going. And that just makes them much more dangerous. In the beginning of the season, Dobbins was, he, he wasn't looking that explosive. Most of the offensive work was being done by Justin Fields as, as a dual threat quarterback. But now that you have Fields playing well and J.K. Dobbins being able to hit the home run on you and knock you out at any time, this offense becomes like Clemson in that, who do you stop? Do you take away Justin Fields and the receivers? Do you take away J.K. Dobbins? You're going to leave... If you're going to take one of those guys away, you're going to leave somebody in single coverage or, you know, you're going to be exposed to one of those uh, players that can beat you. And unlike Clemson, with Ohio State, you have the threat of the quarterback run, too, which gives them even an extra dimension. If, if I was going to rank Clemson and Ohio State, the reason that I would say the reason I have Ohio State 1 and Clemson 2 is is because of the threat of Justin Fields beating you with his legs. That's, that's the dimension that gives Ohio State just that little bit to put them at number one. I noticed that the AP poll had Ohio State three and the coaches poll had Ohio State four. To me, that's just crazy. I don't know who these people are. Who are these people? Listen, if you're watching this video, Send an email to whatever office you have to send one to for the AP poll or the coaches poll or ESPN or wherever. Tell them to watch Vegas Insider YouTube channel and get me voting on these things because I'll get it right. That is absolutely crazy that Ohio State would be three or four. Clearly, they have been the best team in the country. Now, I'm, if they play in a playoff game against Alabama or Clemson, I might take Alabama or Clemson over Ohio State. That's certainly possible. I would have to look at the schemes. I'd have to look at the film and break it down and see who I like. But just as, but just talking about what they've done so far this season with regard to who they've played, Ohio State has been the best team to me. 
Going ahead and looking at the end of their schedule, they have uh, Maryland. They're a 42 and a half point favorite this week against Maryland. Come on, that's ridiculous. Then they play at Rutgers. That's another game they'll win by 40 or 50. So they'll be 10 and 0 after that. Then you have the Penn State game at home. I've been seeing the early line around town in that game as Ohio State minus 14. Minus 14 to 14 and a half. So that tells me right now that Penn State's in big trouble in that game. I always pull for the underdog. If I don't have a bet on the game, if I have no financial interest, um, about 95% I'll root for the underdog. I, that's just who I am and what I do. I always, I always pull for underdogs. So I'll, I'll pull for Penn State in that game, but it's not looking good. If Vegas is putting Ohio State up as a two-touchdown favorite, Ohio State's probably going to win that game. And then your final game at Michigan. That's probably your toughest game. I would think from a from like a BPI predictive standpoint, that's got to be your toughest game. It's on the road in Ann Arbor. Michigan's starting to play better. Uh, Harbaugh's never beaten Ohio State. He, he's got to beat him sooner or later, and he's probably going to beat him at home. So why not this year if he's ever going to do it, right? That being said, Ohio State's a lot better team. But going into that building in a rivalry game where Michigan's starting to play well, it's a tough game, and it's definitely a losable game. I wouldn't expect them to lose that game, but I think of the four games they have left, that is their most likely loss. Now, like how I was talking about with Penn State and Minnesota, if, you, if you're Ohio State and you lose to Michigan, it's actually okay. Just like if you're Penn State and you lose to Minnesota, it's probably actually okay. Ohio State can't lose to Penn State. You have to win the Penn State game. Because if you lose to Penn State but then beat Michigan, well, then you're, you, you, you still don't get to play in the Big Ten title game because you would lose the tiebreaker to Penn State. If you beat Penn State, you can lose to Michigan. You still play in the Big Ten championship game. You still get to beat Minnesota or Wisconsin again or Iowa or whoever comes out of there, and you would finish 12-1, and and you would be in the playoff. The Big Ten champ is going to the college football playoff. So... If you're an Ohio State fan, obviously Michigan is your hated rival. You're, you're going to want to throw up and be sick if you lose to Michigan. But ironically enough, it, as long as you come into that game undefeated, it really won't matter. I still think you make the college football playoff even if you lose that game. 